we're okay to go. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Phil Gomes. I'm the uh, community relations uh, volunteer dude here, and I have the uh, great pleasure of introducing uh, one of our repeat guests, uh, Dahlia Saper of her namesake law firm, The Saper Law Firm. Um, uh, she was here in 2009, and uh, my uh, the most interesting memory from that particular talk was uh, she was talking about the uh, ins, outs, and throughs of open source law, for which we're going to get an update here. And what was most interesting was that the, during the question and, an question and answer period, people raised their hands asking questions like, okay, so what if a friend of mine um, acquired this code somehow and put it up on a website and 10, 10 million people saw it. What happens, right? It's okay. So uh, you, you have the uh, fortune of, of getting um, uh, quite a bit in free legal advice here. So I, <laughs> I suggest that you um, uh, take advantage of it while you can. At this point, we've, we've actually exceeded uh, the capacity of my own memory. So I'm just going to read from the program and tell you that uh, Dahlia Saper is the principal attorney at Saper Law and has served as counsel to many technology and media companies. She is a member of the Illinois Bar and both the General Bar and Trial Bar of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. As a litigator, she handles cases involving trademark and copyright infringement, trade secret misappropriation, online defamation, and commercial disputes. I give you now Dahlia Saper. Thank you. I should hire Phil to answer my phones at the, at the law firm. Okay, hi guys. How many of you heard me give this lecture two years ago? All right, so for those, there's a lot of it is the same, and uh, that's because there hasn't been anything earth shattering that's taken place in the legal landscape within the last two years. The most notable thing that I'll talk about that I do think has emerged is the increase in trademark enforcement in open source uh, licensing. When I gave the lecture two years ago, it was all about what is copyright, and I'm going to I'm going to cover that again today, but um, ne people seem to neglect, or the, the organizations neglect the importance of trademark protection, both on an offensive and defensive side. So without further ado, I will, oh, by the way, I'd like to walk and talk, but I've been instructed that I'm not allowed to leave the microphone, so it's going to be a very rigid lecture for me, but I'll, I'll try. Okay. Uh, plug about my law firm, of course. This is what we do. You can read that. You can go to the web page and see what else we do. All right. From, let's start from the very, very, very beginning. What is intellectual property law, and what are the differences between trademarks, copyrights, and patents? And I think that uh, for business owners and developers, the terms are inter used interchangeably, often incorrectly, and there are a lot of different legal implications depending on if there's a copyright dispute or if there's a trademark dispute or if there's a patent dispute. I'm not a patent attorney, so I'm not going to cover patent law issues, but know that that is un under the umbrella of what is considered intellectual property law. All right. So since the, the newest issue I, I just mentioned was trademark law, let's start there and then go into the heavy-duty copyright law. Who, who, who knows? Well, I gave the answer, but who knows what a trademark is? We'll make this more interactive. Good. Okay. Can, if I asked you what the difference was between a trademark and a copyright, do you feel like you could comfortably answer the difference? All right. Who wants to tell me? Someone, in, someone gentleman in the back row. <laughs> I couldn't quite hear, but anybody else want to? Yep. Trademarks, as I understand it, tend to be a visual thing, uh, and they can be enforced as long as you keep asserting them. Copyright has some kind of a limit. That's true. So there's term differences. That's very right. Well, at its core, trademark is the brand. And it's the name by which, it's t the technical term. It's a source identifier, not to be just you know, confused with source code, but same concept, right? Source identifier, I'm buying this product over another product. I'm using this organization's program versus another organization's program. Copyright law refers to the underlying creative work. So you protect the code as written, the book as written, the movie, the, the music, the photograph. Those are all things that are subject to copyright protection, whereas trademark law is purely the name, the logo, in some cases, the smell or the sound of something. What does that mean? If I walk by someone and I smell their Chanel number no. five, right? I know it's that perfume without having to see the bottle. If I if I have a, if I look at a logo, if I look at a Coke bottle 
and I see the shape and I don't even see the word Coke on it, I'll know it's a Coke bottle and so on. Um, so within, or, within whatever projects you're working on, think about what you're going to be calling it. And if that's an important thing to you, then you need to take measures to protect the trademark, not only your copyright, but the trademark in your code. I'm sorry. Yeah, in, in your code. All right. So as I just said, totally different set of rights. A little bit unlike a copyright or patent, but also the same, is that you get a mini monopoly over the word within the specific class of goods or services. So within the type of software services you're providing with your code, you can stop anyone else in the nation or in the, or in the world, if you go through the appropriate measures, from using your name. And as, what was your name? Clyde. As Clyde mentioned, you need to use and enforce your rights to maintain their trademark protection. What does that mean? Use means the, the, the source, the code, has to be available for, not really purchase, but for use. You have to have people access it. So if you're developing it and no one has, you haven't launched it yet, you would not be able to get trademark protection. You could file what's called an intent to use application to preserve your rights in that name once you are ready to launch. But until you do, and until people can access and use and distribute, you cannot get a federal American trademark registration for your project. After you've used it, you need to maintain your rights because no one's going to go out there and stop someone else from using your name. You have to go out and have attorneys or yourself be vigilant with respect to other comers. Let's use an example. Oh, I, I have quotes from all over as I was updating this presentation, but I like this. Uh, Jay Boss's chief architect listed trademarks as one of the most important considerations for any open source business. Why? Because being the source of code arguably matters more than source code in an open source business. I, I kind of like that sound bite. There's the link. I'll post this presentation up to my website and you can pick, get the links and everything later. All right, so in my own firm, we've, ha we've handled an open source trademark dispute. Um, how many of you have ever gone through the process of getting a trademark? All right. Well, here's how it works, since no, no, most of you have not. What happens is first you do a trademark search, and you want to make sure that no one else has the name that you want to use in, in, in the space that you are intending to, to sell your product. If I want to sell cars and I want to call them Lexus, it's OK that there's another Lexus search engine out there because the end consumer will not confuse Lexus the car with Lexus the search engine. Okay? So the first thing that someone does the com who comes to me is says, here's my name. Do you think I can get it through successfully? So you know, in this case, we said, ooh, my school. I don't know about that. Yep. I can. Um, I, I'll, I'll do a few back steps. So I'll go through the process and explain what rights you get. So once you've done the search, and let's say there's nothing else out there that could potentially pose a problem, then you go through the actual trademark registration process. You fill out the form. You work with your attorney to draft the description. So in this case, my SQL has lots and lots of trademarks. But with respect to this, this dispute. My guy, my client, was providing an online, non-downloadable software for use in database management in the field of school administration. We, we, were, we worried about MySQL, but the first step that you have to, the first hurdle you have to get through is the trademark office itself. There is an attorney that's been um, assigned to your application by the government, the trademark attorney that works for the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and they review your application, similar to the patent application, and they say, all right, I don't know if I'm going to let this go through or not. There's another mark out there that could be confusingly similar to this mark, so um, deny or approve. Okay. So in our case, we were worried. We, we, we let our client know about MySQL, but we said, hopefully your product is different from what MySQL, MySQL's products are, and so that the examiner will not stop your mark from going through because there would be some potential for confusion. And that was right. We actually got it through, and the examiner approved it for what's called publication. Once the trademark gets published, there's a 30-day window for anybody else to come in and oppose that registration. So it's up to the end, you know, business to monitor the marks that get registered through the United States Patent and Trademark Office and say, hey, stop, this is too close to ours. So in this case, that's what happened. MySQL 
filed what's called an opposition proceeding, which is like a mini lawsuit on paper, against my school and said, back off, we're famous, you're not, um, we're more, we have more money than you and we're bigger than you and you have to stop diluting our brand. So this is what the opposition proceeding looks like. Notice of opposition. Um, they have a big fancy law firm. <laughs> so I, not all open source projects have lots of money, of course, but of course my school does. Uh, and this is kind of what an opposition proceeding looks like. They list. Maybe that's part of the reason. Uh, so this is, this is what they do. You typically cite all the different trademarks that you've registered. So MySQL has quite a few, as you can imagine. And then it looks like a little lawsuit. They say, hey, we're, you know, we're actually a s Swedish based corporation. Um, I don't need to read it to you. Uh, if you're interested in reading this, I can send you the link. But as you can see, it's very scary looking and it's a legal document and my school didn't want to spend the money and abandoned it and let them have it. But it's an example of if you're embarking on even a proprietary project utilizing open source or using anything that could sound like an open source project, it's not only the copyrights that you may have to worry about, there's also a lot of trademark litigation that's pending uh, surrounding big business open source stuff, <laughs> okay? So that, that's my little um, quick overview of the trademark process. I have a more extensive presentation about trademarks on my webpage, but think about that. And from now on, most of everything else will be very um, copyright heavy. Before I go to copyrights, quick disclaimer on the patents. A lot of people come to me, especially with mobile apps, right? And like, oh, we have this cool idea for the app to do this or for the project to do this. The idea behind the new project cannot be protected by trademark, cannot be protected by copyright. It can only be protected by a patent. And so that's why you also see a lot of patent litigation. The patents protect the idea for what the software does, but not the software itself. So you need to talk to a patent attorney if you think you have some novel concept that no one else has. Usually it's not the case that you're probably building on somebody else's concept, but in that case, you would only get what's called like an improvement patent over the pre-existing, already existing patents out there. And there's a lot of legal implications with patent licensing, as we all know from other big cases. All right, without further ado, copyright law, which is the bulk of what open source, term open really refers to and, and open source licensing refers to. For the purposes of the Copyright Act, first and foremost, software code, is subject to copyright protection. So that was always a question. Can you, can you register a bunch of you know, inputs that, in a language that's not really English? You know, how, how does that work? And the, and the law is set, copyrights in software are allowed. And once you get them, and first of all, I, haven't, I don't have it in here, but it's very important for all of you who are working on open source projects to get a copyright registration once you're done with the project. Anyone know why? Perfect. You cannot enforce your copyrights unless you file a registration. In other words, you cannot sue anybody to get damages unless you file a registration. How do you file a registration? Uh, so two copies of 50 bucks to uh, 35. <laughs> it's not that expensive. Yeah, exactly. You go to copyright.gov or .com, I think it's .gov. You fill out the right form and you pay them $35 and you submit it. Now if you want, you can also submit your code as a trade secret. There's ways to block out the substantive portions of your code if you don't want anyone else to know it, which wouldn't probably apply to open source. But um, it's a cheap and important thing to do to protect the rights in your copyrights. So before we get into any other litigation and anything else we talk about, any, everybody who's, who's enforcing their copyrights and their code has gone through this registration process. Once you get that lovely copyright registration, these, these four, I mean there's more, but these four primary rights are the rights that you get to prevent other people from doing, if that makes sense. Exclude other people's from these rights. Only the copyright owner has the right to reproduce the work, has the right to create derivative works, has the right to distribute copies of the work, or publicly display the work. Derivative works means, yep. Uh, something like busy bond. You are getting ahead of me. 
That is the core of the whole presentation. Yes, so exactly. If in a traditional copyright setting, this is what happens. I draw a picture, I make a movie, I, 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 I write a song, only I can make, reproduce that song, only I can make a, um, an album with, you know, and add that song to other albums, only I can physically make copies of that album and distribute it, you know, a photo, whatever it may be, and only I can public, in the, you know, publicly displays more in, like in sculpture or art, but, but that's what it means. And when you talk about licensing, you usually parcel out these rights and you say, hey, you know, company X, you will have the limited right to reproduce my work. Or hey, company B, I'm not gonna give you any other rights, but you can be my distributor. I'm gonna make physical copies of something and you will have the exclusive right to distribute whatever it is, or non-exclusive. And so um, at its core, any type of copyright licensing, I don't care if it's open source or not, is, is fundamentally about these set, core set of things you can and cannot do. All right. The verb license, who knows the difference between a license and an assignment? To assign versus license. You already answered, anybody else? <laughs> All right, Clyde, go ahead. Is that your name? No, that was Clyde. Uh, a license is a, a limited right and can be revoked. Assignment is effectively a small Exactly, so in other words, a license is like renting the house and a, an assignment is like selling the house. And if you remember, intellectual property is exactly that, it's property. So when you're thinking of copyrights or trademarks or patents, think of them as if you own a house because the traditional property laws apply to these areas of law. So um, if I license to you the right to use my software, I'm allowing you to borrow or rent my software for a certain period of time for, you know, for a specific purpose. You can only live in my house if you agree not to paint the walls. You can only live in my house if you have, if have no pets, right? Same concept with licensing in, in open source or, or in any type of um, uh, licensing scenario. Um, all right, now why do you want to get a license? Because you want to get permission. You can't just break into someone's house and live there. They, own, they have the keys to the house. So if you don't ask for permission to use the code, you're basically breaking in and entering into somebody else's house. All right, so here's the difference when, between traditional copyrights and the open source movement. What they're saying is, I have these set of rights and I want, I want, to, have, and I want to be able to put conditions on how my work is used within these different set of rights. Um, I think I have another slide, hold on. Right, okay. So because the, you can control the different restrictions on all those different rights, all open source licenses are not the same. So when, you, when someone calls me and says, it's open source, can I use it? I, don't, I can't give them an answer, I don't know. I have to see the contract, the license terms that that specific project has drafted with respect to their code. Um, and each of them obviously have different set of requirements and the major difference is whether or not this particular open source project is copy left or copy right. What does that mean? Copy right is no, 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 no. And copy left is yes, 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 yes. Take it, use it, you know, add to it, distribute it. But, make sh but, but the big difference is if you take it, use it, go for it, you don't have to pay me, you have to make sure that how you use it is, is exactly the same as the rules I put on it. So it's restrictive, but in the opposite way, if that makes any sense. Hopefully it does. Um, all right. In better words, oh, am I not in slideshow mode? You guys didn't tell me that. That's Basically, copy left is uh, whatever you want within certain restrictions. Yes. Uh, yes. Copy left is go ahead, and, go ahead and live in my house. Sure, you know. Bring your friends over for the party, no problem. But you know, you can live in my house, but leave the door unlocked. Essentially, is what is the is the appropriate analogy. I, I have an open door policy. Come and hang out in my you know, house. But if you come into my house, you can't then lock the door and stop other people from coming to the party. Okay, I just made that up. Hopefully, that was not ridiculous. Okay, um, where was I now? It should be more like if you come in the house, you have to tell who I. Yes, that too. And you got to give you got to give the party host credit for you know for for having the party. Yeah, um, I don't remember what slide I was on. That one or the one after. 
All right, so yeah, in other words, copyleft licenses are conditional licenses, just like copyright, normal copyright licenses are. In order to use or distribute software licensed under a copyleft license, any changes you make to the software, or any additions, et cetera, must be released under the exact same license. Um, a copyleft license makes sure that all modified versions of the software remains free and open in the same way that the original software was. And as we know, the GPL is probably the most famous and most used uh, copyleft license. We have the BSD licenses, which are considered more permissive licenses. Who wants, to, who can tell me some of the differences? You guys use the code more than I do. Anyone? No, is that, you're like, that's why I'm here. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't hear you. Right, so exactly, you don't have to redistribute. BSC is mostly like, just give me credit for the most part. They just want, they just want people to know who, who the project is and who can, who can and can't use it, uh, who, who, who contributed to it. Uh, why do we like permissive licenses? Because if you're in the business of software development, you want to make money and you think, hey, I'm going to use some open source to, to, as the foundation for my proprietary platform, then you can. As long as your proprietary platform says, you know, using this open source project code, and that's all you have to do, then you're fine. Unlike the GPL that says, as soon as you touch my code, everything that touches my code has to be open and free as well. Um, so the LGPL is like the GPL, but allows works licensed under it to be linked to by closed source proprietary software, which would not be allowed under the GPL. And the reasoning was originally for libraries, because again, I'm not a software developer, but I, Sometimes you may not be actually integrating with the other software, you're just kind of importing a set chunk of code and that shouldn't impact your proprietary code. All right, so you need to ask some important questions before you start your project. You can call your lawyer to figure it out. Um, ask yourself, if the program is modified, can the results be distributed under a different license? What are the risks of combining the program with my own proprietary software? Are there other requirements besides the ones I just mentioned that would be imposed by the license? Um, oh, practically speaking, a lot of people say, well, this is GPL, can I use it for my internal business process? Yes, the enforcement mechanisms are gonna be difficult and that's the intended purpose of open source. You take it, you modify it, and maybe you create some internal proprietary program to help your business run, fine. You know, you're not technically going to be in violation of the main code, of the underlying license. If you start, if you created like maybe my school, my other client, he, he created this school process, this school software, he said, this is great, uh, you know, why not commercialize this? That's when the problems can kick in. Yeah. Actually, that brings up the question of when you say distribution. Could yeah. you say, as long as you don't distribute it, you're not in violation? You're technically in violation, but no one's going to know about it. <laughs> I mean, and, and it's, not, it's not the purpose of the open source foundations to come after you for using open source to, to build with proprietary code within your organization. There's no, there's no duty to distribute, if that makes sense. Okay. Just because you use it doesn't mean now I have to make everybody allow it. But if I do then want to share it, then it has to be under the same terms. Okay. Um, I think I've covered this. All right, so every license has some additional requirements that must be complied with. Here are some other examples. Warranty disclaimers. Lawyers love warranty disclaimers. This software is, not, is only, you know, is intended for, it's only for its intended purpose. If it blows up your laptop or your computer because something goes wrong, we're not liable, right? And your, your rights to damages are limited to the amount of money that you paid for it, which in open source software is nothing, and so good luck. Warranty disclaimers. Include copyright and attribution notices. This is what most permissive licenses require, and that's all a lot of permissive license requi re licenses require. Attribution means give me credit. It's my project. Another one is provide a copy of the license to a downstream licensee. Seems kind of interesting, right? Just, it's not enough to make the software available. I have to actually very, very easily enable some other person to come in and take the entire project and, and go with it. So you have to actually provide a copy. Sometimes, and some of my clients said, hey, can I just link to the website of the organization where they can download the copy? And I say, yeah, that's probably within the spirit of the license. Um, include a description of any changes made, by the, made to the code by the licensee prior to dis, uh, redistribution, basically uh, track changes concept. 
include an offer to provide the source code to the software upon request, include source code to non-standard software that is required in order for the program to run properly, or and or include a file listing any known intellectual property disputes involving the software. That's why there, this is not a, a comprehensive list, but this is just a list of things that could be in whatever license for whatever open source project you end up using. All right, I found this handy little chart on the internet somewhere. It <coughs> kind of breaks down the main different types of licenses. You know, is it copyleft, BSD? No, not really. Apache, no. GPL, yes. LGPL, weak. You know, um, can you distribute object code without providing source code? Yes, yes. No, no, no. Again, just an example, a snapshot of all the different types of restrictions placed within the different types of projects. So what happens if you breach or you uh, break a license, and this is where the lawyer comes in and scares you, the, the ramifications will be lots of monetary damages, perhaps statutory damages, and of course, attorney's fees, and worst um, in some cases, and an injunction. An injunction means you can't do whatever it is you're doing, you can't sell the 500 million, you know, software copies or whatever, maybe hardware that inc includes open source software, you have to take those off the shelf. You have to take them out of the distribution stream. And that can have some serious ramifications if you have already in commerce and you get slapped with one of these lawsuits after you've spent the money producing, distributing, advertising. Um, so we have the busy box litigations, which uh, most of them have been settled. I don't think there's any, uh, they, they sue and then, or they threaten to sue and people immediately agree not to do whatever it is they're doing. Um, the takeaway from the busy box cases, it was just an attribution one. Even if you don't change the program source code or you're not doing something that's like what you would think is more egregious, you can still get into trouble for something as simple as not giving credit to the original open source project. All right, Jacobson versus Katzer. Sounds like we have some people who follow the law in the room. Anyone want to talk about what that case was? Anyone know? Okay, this, was, this is the lawsuit that basically set the landscape for future open source litigation. The, and I'll, I'll go into more detail. Um, it was an appellate court decision in 2008 that basically said an open source licensor may pursue a claim for copyright infringement if the license clearly sets out conditions on the use of the software. In English, just because I don't have restrictive, I don't have the traditional restrictions on my code, doesn't mean I, I shouldn't be able to enforce my copyrights. So what are the facts? We've got Robert Jacobson. He's, a, he's the plaintiff and a model trained hobbyist. He holds a copyright to the software code that he made available to the public free of charge under an open source license that he called, you know, called the artistic license. The defendants were Matthew Katzer and Camine Associates. They developed commercial software products for the model train industry and hobbyists using part of Jacobson's code. Jacobson brings an action for copyright infringement and he moves for a preliminary injunction, which means these guys have to stop selling their product. Um, and he accused them of copying certain portions of his software and incorporating it into their own commercially available software without abiding by his terms. So Katzer, in his defense, in their defense, uh, they argue that the violation of the terms of the license agreement were merely violations of the contract and not any copyrights. This is where we get to law school stuff. What does that mean? If um, how many of you have ever been commissioned to create a website for somebody? Okay. How many of you were not paid? And did you think I'm going to sue you for copyright infringement? It's something I created and you didn't pay me for it? Perhaps. Um, by the way, do you know that you own the work if you don't have a work for hire agreement? It's not part of this lecture, but we all know this, right? Uh, if you don't, if you don't, if the person who hired you to do whatever it is that you did for them and didn't get you to sign a work for hire agreement, you own the underlying project, but, and this is the part that becomes tricky for these types of cases, the person who you did the work for has an implied license to use the website that you created for that intended purpose. So if you create someone's website and they don't pay you, you can go to court and have a claim for copyright infringement because it was always your understanding that that person's gonna use your website to, for their business. You can only sue for the money. You didn't pay me for the service. 
So what they said in this case is, I didn't violate your, con your yeah, there's no license that I violated you know, in, for your open source contract. It's just a breach of contract. Come after me for money damages. Oh, by the way, I didn't have to pay you anything for it, so you have no money damages, so your case is moot. And so it was a pretty creative argument, and that it makes sense, because why, why should I sue, why should I be sued for something you made free? If it isn't free, just free. Um, and so they said a preliminary injunction remedy is not applicable, nor do they have to pay out any money since there are no actual damages because they breached an open source contract for which no money was exchanged. All right, issue before the court, does failing to adhere to an open source license constitute breach of contract or copyright infringement? That's why it was, you know, lawyers were like drooling over this case because it's, wow, this is, this is interesting. Um, yeah. So the district court sided with the defendants and they denied Jacobson's motion for a preliminary injunction. So Jacobson appeals and the appellate court says that a preliminary injunction is possible since this is a copyright case, but we still need to do more, inves more investigation if it's appropriate. So what the appellate court did, they didn't grant the injunction, but they said, hey, this is a case where an injunction could be appropriate. It's not a contract issue necessarily, it could be a copyright issue. So the main holding of this case and why it's opened the door for lots of new cases since this case is that generally a copyright owner who grants a non-exclusive license to use his copyrighted material waives his right to sue the licensee for copyright infringement and can only sue for breach of contract. That's, that's the general example. That's what I said in the beginning, the website example. But if a license is limited in scope and the licensee acts outside of the scope, the licensee can bring an action for copyright infringement. That's why you hire a lawyer and the, the actual words and the exact phrase you use can have uh, serious legal implications. Anyway, the Jacobson uh, decision found that if an open source license is limited in scope, then a licensee acting outside the scope would constitute a breach of the license and would allow a copyright infringement suit to be brought. Um, <coughs> I, don't need to, I think this is a little too detailed for this presentation, but basically the court in the case found that the restrictions in the contract were both clear and necessary to accomplish the objectives of the open source licensing collaboration, including economic benefits. So they discussed the issue of just because it's free, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no monetary damages here. There was time, there was money spent developing the project, for example, perhaps advertising it, who knows. Um, free does not mean no value. Case eventually settled, it was remanded. You can read settlement docs here. I think I, well, whatever, we'll continue. Um, but if you want to read them, that's the link. God, that's irritating. I don't have the start from this slide button, I don't think. It's an older version. Um, all right, so what's the effect of this case on new open source licensing litigation? As I said, it opens the door for other licensors who are not directly profiting from the licensing of the copyright work to seek protection for their open source software. Now look at your project. Does your license use the appropriate scope limiting terms? You, use, you have to do conditions. In, in, our, in our website services agreements, we say very explicitly for my clients, this is a work for hire, sure, but we retain the rights to the work until you pay us. So it's not, a con it's, not a, it's not a contract. You pay us, we give you the stuff. It's we retain the work. It's a condition for you for the assignment of the work that you pay us. Um, does your license include a portion explicitly stating its purpose in conditioning the use of the open source? Sometimes it's good to explain what the project is and what the value derived from that project is. Uh, different states have different rules about what, what creates a contract versus a license. Um, all right, damages I talked about, these are the, you, you're looking at an injunction, monetary damages, statutory damages, and attorney's fees if you violate a license. Um, you may also look at disgorgement of profits. That's whatever, whatever money you made, you may have to give to the other side. If you're a big company, you made millions and millions of dollars, you might just have to hand over that, that cash to the underlying open source owner. Um, that, Whatever, what, what is the valuation of open source software? People are still talking about this topic, and I think we're gonna kind of touch on it in our panel discussion later this afternoon. Um, but what, what is an appropriate monetary damage for the court to grant in the case of an open source license? If you don't know, you don't wanna test it, because it could be a lot. Um, 
Minimum, this is, this is in general, minimum copyright damages in a case are $750 per infringement, up to $150,000 if the infringement is willful. So in a lot of these open source cases, they don't just file a suit. They tell you, like, hey, you know, this is an open source violation, you gotta stop. Okay, stop. And if you don't, and, and you've, been, uh, you've been informed, they can sue you and you're looking at the higher end of the spectrum for damages. and balancing what the software is versus what it actually does. That's not really copyright stuff. Good question. Um, part of the problem is our court system, they're not, they're not you know, copyright judges or they're not you know, patent judges, but uh, you, would, you can extract certain things, and this issue has presented itself in my practice. I want to use the aggregation of data within an open source project, can I? Um, so sometimes there will be contract terms applying to the, you know, to the data as opposed to the code. Uh, it's going to be a case by case. I can't give you a you know, definitive answer, but it's a good point. Sometimes information is not subject to any sort of protection, but the code that derives the information is. So if you have, you've created um, an open source that kind of aggregates lots of numbers for a certain whatever, the info extracted from that is separate potentially from the code that, that provided that information. And then the information would have to be protected under additional terms in that contract that, you, you know, and you see this when you, when you uh, access websites. You can't access our database for any commercial purpose. You can't hack into it and download every, all the information. It's not really copyright law. It's more just contract law. Um, damages takeaway, be better safe than sorry. I already talked about this. How do you, how are you safe? What are some corporate precautions you should take? Well depending on the project and who you're working for, you want to conduct an audit of the software used so you know what every, you know, legal department and software IT department sometimes aren't talking and they need to. Create a database of the open source software used and distributed by the company. It should be updated regularly. Employ a software development management and version control system. Perfect. Educate employees about the benefits and risks of using open source software. Adopt a corporate open source acquisition and use policy. Here's another problem I, I see in my practice. People are very excited to buy somebody else's code or another person's business. They, the lawyers have no idea what open source means. They don't do their due diligence with respect to open source. Now they've bought something that they think is commercially viable, only to realize you know, four years later when they start selling the product that the underlying platform uses open source. It's GPL or something, it's viral, and you can't sell it because you have to make it free. So it's very important to understand what you're buying if you're acquiring somebody else's code in a business merger and acquisition uh, context. Um, train employees at all levels on, to, on how to comply with the policy and procedures. Choose a software review board consisting of members of the IT department, the product development team, the legal department, and the executive management to review the requests for open source use. Have, a, have an approval method for the review. Um, if necessary, isolate the development team and development environment from the IT department to prevent OSS creep into proprietary software. <laughs> Create a list of favorable open source licenses for developers to consider, but remind them that approval of the use is still required. So you, know, you can use this stuff, but don't use this code. Uh, conduct periodic reviews to ensure employees comply. Um, and so, I mean, so on. Get a good insurance policy is the last one. <laughs> yeah. Perspective of crafting the license? Well, uh, or using a an open source project that you know to build on or to integrate the source and it has some functionality and you know, fail of uh reinvent the wheel of the uh, some of these are released under multiple license functions, maybe BSD or the Golden License and uh LGBL or whatever. Uh, in cases like that, how do you determine uh, whether or not the other? Uh, I mean, the simple answer is read it. I mean, it's
it's not, it's not, when you actually look at these licenses, they're not as scary as you would think. They're pretty, they're, they're meant to be drafted so that the average person using the, the source code will, will understand it. Please give us permission. If you're gonna use it, make sure other people can use it. And so we've sometimes done audits where we literally just cut and pasted the, the political paragraphs from the different licenses and said, here's what you need to do, you know, and just directed them to the right spot. So it, it doesn't have to be a scary thing. Your lawyer should guide you and hold your hand, but it's something you should, you should be able to learn open source licenses as, you know, as part of your business practice, as part of being a developer. Um, so again, it's case by case, what are you using? What does it say? Not once you've been served with a complaint. Good Questions? Good. Yeah. Oh, lots. Of, uh, we're going back and then we'll go up. Um, go ahead. Oh, so let's say you're working on a project, you started it with a hobby, and you put it online, and it's like all the versions you've been working on, like GitHub or Google or whatever. Uh, you don't have a license for it at all, just that. And you can start sketching on it, and you can start using it if you want to put a license on it. How does that license work? It is a premium version. So, Now, have you registered your code? Uh, registered now. Through the copyright office? No. Just you need to do that before we even have this conversation. But um, <laughs> the, the default law is that the copyright owner has the exclusive right to do all of those things, right? Reproduce, add, create derivatives. So if you then subsequently, I mean, it can only get better is my point. So you, if you go out there and you allow people to, to use it and do whatever they want with it, then you as the right owner has, has basically donated parts of it to the public domain or you've decided not to enforce your rights with respect to those people. Um, as soon as you have licensed terms, it would apply proactively, meaning since I, those terms didn't apply to me before, I will have to abide by them as of this date. So continual use would mean the new rules would apply to you. Whoa, okay. I don't know, someone's screaming at me. Phil. Oh, five minutes, five minutes, okay. I thought the burn convention meant that you get your rights as soon as you fix it. Yes. Or you have a Correct. But in America, burn convention gives, burn convention is the international treaty that says a copyright in America is good in France and a copyright in France is good in Belgium or whatever, China, even though, good luck. Um, so. Yes, that's my point. It's fit, it, your rights are you can't. No one can reproduce whatever, 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 whatever until you've uh, uh, until until you say otherwise. Does that make sense? But as you said, you can't litigate until you register. Right. Right. No. Yes. And, 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 and there, and, and as far as I know, there's no. It doesn't take, it's not hard to register. And there was, there's been a lot of litigation over whether or not a pending copyright registration is good enough to file an ap actual suit, and there's uh, jurisdiction splits on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, did you say something about public domain? Like, is that actually a license, or is that like a new license? Good question. What does the public domain mean? Public domain means I donated it to the public domain. So essentially open source software, it, it's actually no. A public domain is, it's, it's, there's no restrictions on the use. Open source software has restrictions. Um, there's several ways of something can become public domain, some can be in the public domain. One is I've given it, I, you know, Flickr accounts, you can press, hey, I'm cool with anyone using it, you know, I'm giving it, donating to the public domain. The second is it's old. So copyright, someone mentioned, have a term. Usually copyrights only last 70 years after the death of the person who the author, or in the case of an organization or corporation, 120 years after its creation. So if something's older than that, it's automatically in the public domain. If someone wants to just donate it to the public domain, that would just be explicitly stated. So it's a software written around the war that's <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. So the insurance policy, is that for the producer or consumer of code? Everybody gets insurance. And what, is, what does that mean? Just it covers the legal fees when you get sued.
unless the business, the, the proprietary business model is, service, is servicing open source, if they're actually, GPL is scary, because let's say you do want to add something proprietary, you want to make money off the actual distribution of the code, you will not be able to. Yeah, you can certainly sell copies of it if you want. You have to make the source available and sell services to it. And there are many successful businesses uh, that have developed open source uh, software, uh, very complex and valuable software. Uh, but because they're so familiar with it, companies that are buying it, uh, buy it because they support it and have support for it. So they, you know, it's like Red Hat. Yeah, you're not buying Red Hat enterprise living, you're buying the support for Red Hat. but this part is not. Um, that goes back to my initial comment that all licenses are different. And just because part of it may be open source doesn't mean another part is as well. You can write your own license. Yeah, right. Exactly. Oh, okay, sure. For what? someone else who owns it. So if you own it, you get to, you know, you draw a picture, you can give it to whoever you want and however you want. Yeah. With all the Android tablets coming out, um, they're not releasing the code along with it. From what I understand, um, Android uses the Apache license on certain parts, and so they don't have to release the whole code, but there are parts in it that are using the code. I mean, like that link I talked about, like some of my clients, I say just provide a method for the person to go and access it. So it gives explicit, explicit instructions as to how to access the underlying code. I haven't done with this yet. I actually spoke to Bradley about this. It appears to be a mass violation by all the all the Apache licenses. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Is, is there, who, who would actually follow up on that? Like our, your legal team? Thank you. Good.